church. Hello, hello, once again, and hello everyone out there live on Facebook. So the name of the sermon is God is Meaning. God is Meaning. In and of itself, um, I was going to name it God equals meaning, but then that's to say you know, uh, vice versa would be true. It's like, no, no, God is meaning. So throughout the book of Ecclesiastes, uh, it's, it come off a little bit like a downer. You know, it's, it's, it's by Solomon. Solomon being the, the son of King David, known as one of the wisest men ever, because God says he's one of the wisest men ever. It's not just him saying that himself, about himself. And he constantly, he just comes to the conclusion that like everything in life, everything is meaningless. It's just meaningless, or it's vain, or it's chasing after the wind, or what's the purpose when it's like it all disappears at the end. You know, as I, as I read Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verses 13 to 14, it goes, I devoted myself to search for understanding and to explore by wisdom everything being done under heaven. I soon discovered that God has dealt a tragic existence to the human race. I observed everything going on under the sun, and really, it is all meaningless, like chasing the wind. It's like, wow, it kind of comes off a bit of a downer. It's like, I've done, he's, the thing is with him is that he's literally, it's the ultimate case of a been there, done that, okay? Wealth, very few people had more wealth than he did, like, ever, right? Incredibly, incredibly wealthy. The probably like largest uh, kingdom when the, Israel was probably the largest was with, uh, with King Solomon. As far, like I said, as far as wisdom is concerned, if God's calling you one of the wisest human beings on earth, you're wise. You know, that's clearly, he, under, he has an uh, excellent sense of understanding. Pleasures, over hundreds, hundreds of wives, whichever one, I, you know, I, I make the joke, whatever, whatever woman the guy is just like fawning over, that's probably wife number like 85 for him, you know. It didn't like he, whatever he wanted and he work, he worked hard. He worked really hard. He disciplined himself. And it's not only just that it was, oh, he just worked so hard. He even stopped to enjoy life and enjoy parties and laugh and just have a great old time. And yet, at, this, at the end of the day, he goes, it's all, it's all meaningless. You know, as I read in Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 4 to 5 and 7 to 11. I also tried to find meaning by building huge homes for myself and by planting beautiful vineyards. I made gardens parks, and filling them up with all kinds of fruit trees. I bought slaves, both men and women, and others were born into my household. I also owned large herds and flocks, more than any of the kings who had lived in Jerusalem before me. I collected great sums of silver and gold, treasure of many kings and provinces. I hired wonderful singers, both men and women, and had many beautiful concubines. I had everything a man could desire. So I became greater than all who had lived in Jerusalem before me. And my wisdom never failed me. Anything I wanted, I would take. I denied myself no pleasure. I even found great pleasure in hard work, a reward for all my labors. But as I looked at everything I had worked so hard to accomplish, it was all so meaningless, like chasing the wind. There was nothing really worthwhile anywhere. Now, I know a lot of people, you read, the, you read this book, it's, you know, 12 chapters, not too long of a book, you know, it wouldn't take you too long to, to read through it. And I, I, you know, I was talking about this, like I've, I've heard some commentaries and it's like this one take that I was like, I was annoyed to hear it's like, well, no, it's Solomon. Yeah, he's wise, but this is the air. This is towards the end of his life where he's going through like a midlife crisis. That's why he, I was like, why do you mean? What do you mean? He's, why would the Lord just put like, oh, yeah, he's wise and this is his midlife crisis? And it's like, no, it's, there's, there's, there's deeper purpose and meaning to this book than this guy just like, oh, you know, woe is me. I read this book and it's, it's yeah, you could see it as pessimistic, but I read it as just it being a warning letter a realistic warning letter about life. This is a man that whatever you're chasing, whatever your dreams, whatever your goals were or is in life, he accomplished that, plus other ones, other goals that other people had. He accomplished all the goals that you could ever, that you would want to accomplish. He did it. 
He denied himself no pleasure. And it's just a realistic take. And if, if you just constantly just chase after this stuff, listen, like he's like, I've been there, done that. It is meaningless. Just going back to, you know, before I was a Christian, when I was a teenager, I had a, had a flip phone, right? And um, it's somewhat similar. And every, you know, every, I would look at my phone. I had my phone off. I turned it on. It was a greeting. There was a greeting message. It was custom. So I wrote, every day is a day closer to death. Now, I wasn't like this angsty teenager, always angry or anything. You know, matter of fact, it'd say that message. And then it would be a photo of me with like, you know, a giant smile with two, two of my thumbs up. Was, to me, it was just funny. But there is the idea of, of like, listen, we have a limited time while here on earth. This is reality. We have limited time while we're here on earth. And every day that you're alive is a day closer to when you will not be alive. And to me, it was all about being grounded in reality. It's like not about being optimistic, pessimistic, idealistic, realistic. Yeah, you know what? People will, people will perish. Things age, things uh, fall apart. And not for nothing, when I read this book, first time I actually read this book, read it through, I mean, I loved it. It was about 13 years ago, and I was a, a young Christian, you know, it's like uh, mid-20s, early 20s. And I remember like, wow, like while I was reading through it and it was a time in my life where I was, I was honestly kind of depressed. You know, I was kind of depressed, kind of like downtrodden, just going over like a, a list of things that I didn't have in my life. I, I didn't have a car. I, I didn't have my own house. I didn't have savings. I didn't have a career. I didn't have a wife or kids. You know, I didn't, it's like, wow, all these things that, you know, people... I mean, nowadays, it's like, whatever. But there was, you know, a certain level of, like, expectations of what you would have in your life at certain stages. And I remember, like, wow, like, I was comparing myself to other people and how it wasn't fitting in, you know, it wasn't fitting in with that, you know. So I read this, this whole book, and at the end of this book, let me tell you, I had a sense of peace and a sense of joy and it just, it's sort of like, I just like, oh, weight was lifted off my, my, my uh, shoulders, you know? Really beautiful. I stopped comparing myself to others about how other people are living versus how I'm living, you know, what's really important in life, you know? And I'll read the last, look, I'll read the last uh, verses and the last chapter, right? So these are the final words in Ecclesiastes. That's the whole story. Here now is my final conclusion Fear God, obey his commands, for this is everyone's duty. God will judge us for everything we do, including every secret thing, whether good or bad. I was like, amen. amen. Just trust. It's like all these other things that if you want to just seek after this one thing in life, whatever, or, you know, the, the money or the pleasure or, or being the smartest human being. He goes, what? Why does it matter if you work so hard, you come home to, to no one? You have no friends and no family. Like, that's horrible. It's like, what, what, what's the purpose of being super wise and you read all the books as possible? And yet, the person that's a fool and the person that is intelligent and smart both die at the end. You know? And that's like, oh, it's, it's, like, oh, it's, it's, it's a harsh reality. It's a, it's a true thing, true statement. But at the end of the day, what matters, what truly has meaning is God. God is meaning in and of itself. And I'll read, this is from 16, hold on, 1646. Uh, hold on. Uh, the Westminster, yeah, Westminster Shorter uh, Catechism. Now this is, this is a, a doctrinal, doctrinal standard from the Church of England, of Scotland, Presbyterian Church, some Baptist churches use this. And it's just a foundational thing for different churches about what they believe. And so it is the first question they have in the Westminster Shorter Catechism. What is the chief end of man? Man's chief end is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. Amen. Amen. That is the meaning. That is the purpose of life. Amen. Enjoy the presence of God. Glorify God on a daily basis says in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verses 31. So whether you eat or you drink, whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. Romans chapter 11, verses 36. 
For everything comes from him and exists by his power and is intended for his glory. All glory to him forever and ever. Amen. Amen. You see, truly the purpose of life is to be close to God and to see the accomplishments, relationships, the good times, the challenging times, and all the money and all the material wealth as what? As gifts from God. It is he that gives life. To make anything else the source of meaning is to live an incomplete life, lacking in peace and the security and the joy that the Lord has for us all. May we grow uh, spiritually. May we grow in God's love. That's truly, when it talks about, in, I'll read it eventually, when it talks about it in Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21, it talks about a prayer for spiritual growth. This is Paul talking. Paul, Paul is going to all these different places, praying for people, no matter what, his ship, ship gets wrecked, people you know, try to stone him, try to kill him, and you're like, well, what does Paul know? What, what makes him strong in God? You know, like, what makes him so powerful? He's like a powerful man, you know, out, you know for being saved, you know, saw to Paul, you know, he's like amazing man of God. And he goes like this, the main thing where how you grow spiritually is by concentrating, focusing, constantly thinking of God's love for you. Amen. God loves you. God wants to take care of you. So all this stuff, all, like I said, all the, the accomplishments, the good times, the bad times, what this life is and all the things in life, you should truly think of as gifts from God. You should focus on the gift giver, on the Lord himself. And that's when everything else comes like food tastes better. The relationships are, 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 are stronger because the main focus is not on the things here on earth. It's not on the things that, that are here today and fade tomorrow. The focus is on God himself. He is the gift giver of life. He's a gift giver of grace. You focus in on him. Know that God is the purpose and the meaning of your life. And where the issue comes into play is you have to look introspectively what is the definition of success? It's for you, subjectively. It's for your own, own, own sort of own opinion, own way of thinking. How do I define success? Is it getting closer to God? Is it, is it something else? Is it something here that, that, that's here today and fades tomorrow? Is it based off of, oh, I'm, well, I'm a good father, uh, you know, good mother, uh, I'm a great whatever occupation it is? What is success in your life? Something for you to think about. Because the Lord wants it to be him. Success is being close to him. First and foremost, it should be him. Everything else is a gift from him. Amen? As I read Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. When I think of all this, I fall to my knees and pray to the Father, the creator of everything in heaven and on earth. I pray that from his glorious unlimited resources, he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit. Then Christ will make his home in your hearts as you trust in him. Your roots will grow down in God's love and keep you strong. And may you have the power to understand, as all God's people should, how wide, how long, how high, how deep his love is. May you experience the love of Christ though it is too great to understand fully. Then you will be made complete with all the fullness of life and power that comes from God. Now all glory to God who is able through his mighty power at work within us to accomplish infinitely more than we might ask or think. Glory to him in the church and in Christ Jesus through all generations forever and ever. Amen. Amen. That's Ephesians chapter 3, verses 14 to 21. What is the purpose of your life? What, where do you find meaning in your life? And I'm here to tell you, Solomon, whatever you could have thought of, he accomplished. He did it. Been there, done that. It's a warning letter. Amen? It is a warning letter. What truly should have meaning is God, serving God, glorifying the Lord, 
Because God is the giver of life in and of itself. So everything that this life has to offer is gifts from him. We should think in that, in, in that way. Amen? Amen. Let's all bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for life. We thank you, Lord, for, for, just, uh, for, for fellowship. We thank you for your covenant. We thank you, Lord, for your sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Uh, Lord Jesus, we know, Lord, we know, Lord, I pray, Lord, I pray, Lord, that, that we find meaning, truly, truly, we find meaning in you and you alone, Lord. And may everything here that this earth has to offer, all the friendships, relationships, everything, uh, you know, just the, the material wealth, may it all just be looked at as, as just as gifts of, of, this, of this life, of, of uh, this rich earth that you have placed us upon, Lord. May we not make it our idols. May we not make it our, 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 our meaning. Let us not put meaning into that about what is the purpose of our life, Lord. Because our purpose in life is to enjoy your presence, is to glorify you, Lord, is to obey you, Lord Jesus, because you truly are, are the one who created life in and of itself. You are love in and of itself, uh, Lord Jesus. And, and Lord, you keep your promises with us, Lord. We are co-heirs in Christ. We are... a, a a kingdom of priests, Lord Jesus. May we see that as a true identity, that we are ambassadors of heaven while here on earth, uh, Lord Jesus. May we not just focus in on, on our success being on something that's here today and gone tomorrow, Lord. And we pray, Lord, that we take this book of Ecclesiastes as a warning, as a warning from someone that's, that has done it, Lord, that did live that life. May we take it as a warning and we don't fall into the, the temptations and the traps that this world has, Lord. May we see it for what it is, and may we see you for who you truly are. You are the giver of life and of love, and we are made to be in right relation with you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.